Hello Year 7, I hope everybody's well. I've put this little video together um, to try and give you some background to Romeo and Juliet, just in case you're um, finding it a bit confusing, finding it difficult to get a grasp on it. And because I think it's quite interesting to know the background too, it helps to um, inform our interpretation. It helps us to perhaps read the text in um, different ways. Um, so as I go through, I do talk quite quickly sometimes. So you might have to pause the video or slow it down a little bit. Um, I'm also going to show some pictures. Um, they've got some it's statues with nudity and painting um, with, with nudity on it. So I, I think you'll be okay with that, but just be aware that it's coming up. There's also um, an extract from a history book about a violent attack. So um, some of it's a little bit gruesome. Um, so just be aware that that's coming up as well. But I think you'll be fine with that. So let's have a look at this word context here. It just means background or setting. So the play was set in Verona in Italy um, during a period called the Renaissance. Um, if I set a play in London in the 1980s um, called Romeo and Juliet, it would be a very different play because the culture of the times would be very different. So I'm hopeful that um, this video will help you to understand the setting, the background of Shakespeare's play. So the play is set in Italy during a period called the Renaissance. Now it's important to understand that people at the time didn't think they were going through the Renaissance. It's a label that we've given to this period of time much later, a long time after it's happened, but it's a really convenient label to give to this period. So we're talking um, to help you understand during a time when Henry VIII would have been the king in this country and his daughter Queen Elizabeth I would have been queen so it's going back a, a few hundred years um, this word renaissance means rebirth so naissance is the birth bit and then re just means the same as in the word here um, doing it over again so it's the rebirth of something something was being revived revolutionized and um, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get down to here it's important to understand that Italy at the time as it is now was a Catholic country and the most important person in the country was the Pope so the Pope was the most important person in Catholic countries so many countries were Catholic and England had been Catholic until Henry VIII changed that. And the Pope was God's agent on earth. So you would want to um, do what you could to be involved perhaps with the Pope if you wanted to be an important person. You would want the Pope to favour you. Um, so that's important for our, our context. Also, Catholics would confess their sins to their priest. That's important to our play because lots of things are done in secret. The relationship takes place between Romeo and Juliet in secret. And the priest, Friar Lawrence, um, is involved in their relationship. And if you were a Catholic, and lots of people are still Catholics today, you would be in the habit of confessing your sins to your priest and the priest would keep those um, sins to himself. It would be your duty to, even if your, your sin was just a, a bad thought, it would be your duty to confess your sin and to therefore lift the guilt that you felt because you had committed a sin. So that's important for the theme of secrecy in the play and the involvement of the priest, Friar Lawrence. Also, um, sadly, suicide is um, an event that takes place in the play and suicide is very much a sin in the Catholic religion because you should never despair so much that you don't believe that God can be your salvation. To, so to commit suicide from despair is to act against God. 
um, just talking about traditional Catholic views here. So what was this Renaissance? Well, it was a cultural revival. There were revolutions in education, arts and culture. Different things were being learned and education was being seen as a, a very valuable part of life. Um, painting, sculpture and architecture were being revived and updated and generally the culture was one of enrichment, not just staying in your place and accepting things the way they were, but actually making something of your life, making the world better for yourself. And the self-made man is a concept that we're familiar with today because we all know people who perhaps have quite humble beginnings, but they they really make a success of their lives and you know you may be related to someone or you may know somebody who never really perhaps succeeded early in life or didn't come from a particularly um, ad advantageous background but they managed to make their life a real success I certainly know lots of people whose beginnings were very ordinary but actually they've they've now got their own business um, so that's an example of a self-made man and when I say man that, that's just a generic term obviously many women are highly successful because um, being a self-made man or self-made person is uh, recognizing your skills and exploiting every opportunity to develop those skills until you make life better for yourself. Um, so being a, a self-made man during the Renaissance would come with um, increasing power and money. And as part of that, your children would marry strategically. So marriage was strategic, um, just like it was with kings and queens, really. They would marry um, because it would make their their um, family more politically stable. Um, and in Romeo and Juliet, Juliet is expected to marry a character called Paris because it's good for um, her family, for the Capulet family. So those are just some ideas that might help you to understand why certain things happen in the play. So on your screen now, you've got a, a painting, a portrait of a very important man for the Italian Renaissance called Cosimo de Medici but I want to talk about um, his family background a little bit and hopefully this will help to illustrate why family is so important. Um, Cosimo came from what was originally a fairly unimportant family in Florence so we're talking about Florence instead of Verona but what happens here is reflected in Shakespeare's play. Um, so the, the Medici family started off as wool merchants and made enough money to be able to lend money to other people. So they became early sort of bankers in the city of Florence in Italy. So this is what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about self-made men. Okay, and one day um, Cosimo's um, father Giovanni de Medici grabbed an opportunity and I think this is a really interesting story because there was a character called um, Baldassare Cossa who whose family once had been important and wealthy but they'd sort of fallen away from this the family name had fallen into decline and Baldassare Cossa actually became a pirate and made some money from being a pirate but he wanted his family's power back he wanted to become important so he went to Cosimo's father um, Giovanni de Medici and asked if he could lend him some money because he wanted to um, build a campaign to become a pope so you need money in order to sort of buy people's support and actually as, as bad as um, this man's reputation was because he'd been a pirate Giovanni de Medici made the extraordinary decision to lend him some money and he actually did then become Pope this pirate Baldassare Cossa became Pope so he became the most important person in the Catholic world and he didn't forget who his friends were and he kept the Medici family as 
his bankers. So the Medici family became bankers to the Pope. So the Medici family became very important, very powerful in Florence, just as the Montagues and the Capulets are important people in Verona in the play Romeo and Juliet. So they were a very powerful family. Now Giovanni's son, Cosimo here, he's a bit of a cultural hero of mine. He was a very um, educated and cultured man and he appreciated um, ancient ideas and introduced ancient ideas that revived arts and culture. When I think about ancient ideas, it makes me think about um, Euripides. So he's a character that we've um, looked at in class in the play um, The Trojan Women. And Cosimo went to great lengths to draw out ideas from ancient Greek and pass those on to others. And Therefore, that became influential in the writing of the time. So people like Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe and Ben Jonson wrote in a way that was similar to the ancient Greeks. And he um, therefore developed this much richer culture. And this also meant that people started to appreciate that they didn't have to accept their position in society, that actually you could make your own life better because the whole world looked richer and much better. And then the family, the Medici family, became patrons, patrons sorry, of highly revered artists. So what I mean by that is that they gave financial support and protection to some artists that were became very much respected at the time but that we still respect today and I'm going to tell you a little bit more that, about that in another slide. But Cosimo here um, is, for me, he's the father of modern culture because he was so influential in changing things from the medieval period into what we now call the Renaissance period. So, you know, he was able to do that because this family had built up this power and influence <clears throat> and that's related to the idea of powerful and influential families in our play. So a family like the Medici would illustrate their power and wealth and influence by supporting artists. And this also helped um, with the drive to improve art and culture during the Renaissance period. So we've got some really famous artworks here to, to demonstrate the, the influence of a powerful and um, rich family. This statue here you probably recognise as Michelangelo's statue of David and Michelangelo was taken in to the Medici household as a boy because they recognised his talent and they wanted to nurture it and then when he was a young man he produced this magnificent statue which is in the Academia in the city of Florence. If you ever get a chance to go and see it I would really encourage you to do so because you can see it's it's a wonderful piece of art in the picture, but when you actually are, are close to it and you can look up at it, it it's absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, and just as an aside, this also illustrates the idea of the Renaissance self-made man, because in the Bible story, David is just a humble shepherd boy. And when the giant Goliath threatens his community, nobody wants to take Goliath on. They think he's just too powerful. But David steps forward and all he's got with him is this, this what we call a slingshot. And he can put a stone in there and use it almost in the way that you use a catapult. And he, he does that. And he his aim is so true that he manages to kill the giant Goliath. So somebody who, who seemingly has nothing actually when they exploit their talent and they recognize an opportunity they achieve greatness and that's exactly what a renaissance self-made man is um, so this is really important and the statue of david was shown outside in florence and it was a, it was a sign to the people of, of strength and power but it was also a sign to outsiders um, of um, how you should think twice before you want to to take on the people of florence but you know this is a statue by a man who was patronized by the medici family so it's also a sign to other families of how powerful 
the Medici family is. And then um, this is a picture of the Sistine Chapel, also um, by Michelangelo. I haven't seen this. This is in the Vatican City in Rome. The Vatican City is uh, is the home of the Pope, a city within a city. Um, and this statue here is also of David. This is by Donatello. So he was also um, nurtured and under the patronage of the Medici family and it's a statue in bronze and that's in the Bargello Museum also in Florence um, so it's another symbol of the Medici family's power and influence and how they could revive culture because because they had this power and influence um, and this beautiful, absolutely stunning painting here is also in the city of Florence. It's in the Uffizi Museum. And this is The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. Again, um, the Medici family um, were patrons of um, Botticelli, supported his art. And the reason I've included this is because I've talked about how Cosimo de' Medici wanted to draw the best ideas from Greek culture to help revive Italian culture during the Renaissance. And the, the figure here of Venus is a figure from Greek mythology. We, we know her from, from the work that we've done as Aphrodite, the Romans knew her as Venus so that's a sign of the revival of the culture and none of this was possible without the support the money and the power of the Medici family so they they took an interest they invested in these artists and then these works here became symbols of what can happen if um, you look after somebody's talent and invest in them as well. So this is, these are signs of the Medici family's power and wealth. And, and in relation to the play Romeo and Juliet, we're talking about how a family has to keep exercising and showing their power um, so that another family can't overpower them which is the case for the Capulets and the Montagues and how much therefore there's this um, antagonistic relationship between them which means that Romeo and Juliet can never really comfortably be together. So as a wealthy and powerful family how else could you show people that wealth and power? Um, well one way is by creating huge buildings so in front of you you've got the cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore Saint Mary of the Flowers and Fiore flowers is also the origins of the, the city named Florence, which in Italian is Firenze. Um, so this cathedral was built by the Medici family. Obviously it keeps you in great favor with the Catholic Church to build a cathedral, um, but it also shows people for many, many miles around um, just how powerful you are if you've got a huge building like this. Now, the problem with this building was they, they built most of it, they had most of it built, but they couldn't figure out what to do to cap off this part here. There was no dome on it, rain was pouring into it. Um, and then this is another story of the extraordinary patronage of the Medici family. This is a, a character called Filippo Brunelleschi, and you can see in his hand he's got a a picture of a dome so he was an engineer and an architect and he was the only person who after many years could come up with a solution to the building of the dome and he developed a new way um, which you can't see because it's covered by this slate here new way of building a dome so that its weight wouldn't make it collapse in fact its weight made it more sturdy um, and he was an extraordinary character he didn't come from very rich beginnings his father was a civil servant so he's another example of a self-made man um, and you know again the the family put up with his eccentricities um, because they recognized that he had an extraordinary talent so Filippo Brunelleschi here was responsible for putting the dome on this cathedral and then that kind of sealed this idea of the Medici power and influence you can imagine having a cathedral that wasn't finished off 
It said that you were powerful enough to have a cathedral built, but that you weren't powerful enough to have it finished off. So when um, Brunelleschi came along and finished off the cathedral, it really um, pushed forward this idea that the Medici family was an important family. And again, we're talking about the need to keep hold of your power um, in an Italian city during the Renaissance, which is what the Montague family and the Capulet family want to do, and which is a reason why they just can't get along with each other. So family is very, very important. The idea is that you stay loyal to your family and if you're a member of the Capulet family it's your duty to do everything you can to show your loathing of the Montague family and if you're a member of the Montague family there is no way you would have anything to do with the Capulet family and of course Romeo is a Montague and Juliet is a Capulet so really they're not supposed to have anything to do with each other which is why there's so much secrecy when they do develop a relationship. So what you've got in front of you is a painting that depicts the Montague family and the, the Capulet family. And in real Italy, you could say that one of these families is the Medici family. And there was a, a family that was a rival family in Florence called the Pazzi family. Um, but you can see, you know, swords drawn, aggressive stances, quite aggressive or concerned looks on faces. It looks as though at any moment, because there's lots of tension between them, they could start attacking each other. So the sight of a Capulet or a member of the Capulet household, if you were a Montague, would be enough to really get your heckles up and put you into attack mode and vice versa. So the, the atmosphere in Verona as it would have been in Florence is one of suspicion, always watching your back because you didn't know what the um, rival families would be up to. Um, and of course, if you were um, Romeo and Juliet, then that would spell out a lot of trouble for you if you thought that there was any way that you two could be together. Now I've mentioned so far the Medici family and the Pazzi family that were two rival families in Florence in the way that the Montague family and the Capulet family are two rival families in Verona. So what I'd like to do now is just spend a few minutes reading you an account of the aggravation and violence that a family grudge can lead to. So this is about um, Lorenzo. De Medici. It is Sunday the 26th of April 1478 in Florence and the church bells ring out from the towers above the rooftops of the city. Lorenzo the Magnificent, accompanied by his circle of favourites, is making his way through the colourful crowds towards the cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Okay, so Lorenzo de Medici, a member of this very powerful family, is walking to the cathedral that you saw in the earlier slide for a church service and he's got a younger brother called Giuliano and he, he really loved his younger brother Lorenzo. So back on the Via Larga Lorenzo's younger brother Giuliano is hurrying to catch up with him limping from a bout of painful sciatica. He is accompanied by Francesco de Pazzi and his friend Bernardo Bandini. So the young Medici boy, Giuliano, is friends with the young Fran um, Pazzi boy, Francesco de Pazzi. And as they walk down the street, Francesco rests a comradely arm around Giuliano's shoulder, helping him to overcome his limp, assuring him there is no need to hurry. He gives Giuliano a playful squeeze. So he's being all friendly to, this Patsy boy is being all friendly to Giuliano de' Medici. But whilst he's giving his body a playful squeeze, it, noting that he's not wearing any chainmail body armour beneath his colourful doublet. So he's pretending to be friendly and all the time he's working out whether this uh, boy Giuliano is protected or not. When they reach the church, Giuliano sees that his brother Lorenzo is already up by the high altar surrounded by his friends and two priests, one of whom Giuliano recognises as a tutor to the Pazzi family. The service begins and Giuliano de' Medici decides to remain by the door with Francesco de Pazzi, Bernardo Bandini and his companions. 
the sung responses of the choir ring out in the high echoing interior of the cathedral beneath the towering dome. Then the chanting voices fall silent and the priest conducting the service prepares to celebrate high mass. The sacristy bell tinkles above the murmuring conversations taking place amongst the informally assembled congregation and their voices too fall silent as the priest elevates the host before the high altar. That's the priest holding up the um, wine and bread to be blessed by God so that it becomes the, the blood and body of Christ which is part of the Catholic communion service. Right, the moment the priest raises the host, two separate incidents take place simultaneously. By the door, Bernardo Bandini whips out a dagger, turns and plunges it into Giuliano de' Medici's head with such force that Giuliano's skull is split open with a spray of blood. Next, Francesco de Pazzi begins stabbing in a frenzy at Giuliano's falling body, slashing again and again like a man possessed. Such is his mindless fury as he hurls himself forward onto the prostrate body of Giuliano that he is blinded with blood and even plunges his dagger into his own thigh. So the Pazzi family and the Medici family are in a fight. At the same moment, up at the high altar, the two priests standing behind Lorenzo have swiftly pulled out daggers from beneath their robes. One places a hand on Lorenzo's shoulder as he prepares to stab him in the back, but Lorenzo spins round and the tip of the descending dagger only slices through the skin of his neck. As he staggers back, he wrenches off his cloak, swirling it over his arm to form a shield while his other hand while with his other hand he rapidly draws his sword. The two priests retreat aghast, their daggers still raised. Immediately there is a melee of bodies around Lorenzo, with shouts and the slicing of steel as Lorenzo's attendant friends draw their swords, protecting him as he leaps over the altar rail and sprints for the safety of the open sacristy door. By now, Bernardo Bandini has left Giuliano de' Medici for dead and is rushing through the congregation, his sword drawn. He attempts to cut off the fleeing Lorenzo, but Lorenzo's friend Francesco Nori hurls himself between them and Bandini runs him through with a single lunge, killing him instantly. Amidst the confusion, another friend is wounded in the arm, and by the time Bandini can recover, Lorenzo and his friends are inside the sacristy, heaving the heavy bronze doors closed. Lorenzo claps his hand to his neck. He can feel that the blood is flowing but it is only a surface wound. Antonio Ridolfi, who is standing beside Lorenzo, impulsively launches himself forward, grabbing Lorenzo by the shoulders, appearing to kiss him on the neck. Lorenzo is aware of his friend sucking at his wound and then spitting out the blood. The priest dagger point may have been poisoned. Even through the bronze doors, they can hear the uproar that is broken out among the con congregation, where there is a tumult of cries and shouts. Lorenzo starts forward, exclaiming, Giuliano, is he safe? His friends glance at one another. No one replies. Amidst the pandemonium in the cathedral, Giuliano's assassins and the two priests melt away through the throng, while all kinds of rumours begin to spread amongst the crowd outside the cathedral. Some say the great dome has collapsed and people begin running back through the streets for the safety of their homes. Others clamour to get inside the cathedral. Most cluster in bewildered groups, comforting the distressed and weeping. After a few minutes have elapsed and nothing further happens, Lorenzo's friends whisk him out through a side door of the cathedral, bundling him down the street towards the safety of the Palazzo Medici. So what that true account demonstrates there is how much family pride mattered, how much there was a, a, a sense of antagonism between different powerful families in the city of Florence, which can be reflected in the play Romeo and Juliet as the antagonism between the, the Montague family and the Capulet family. So now we've talked about the background and how important it is as a family to show your power and influence. Um, let's have a look at the prologue of Romeo and Juliet. So a prologue is just a little bit of background, um, an opening in the play before the play itself really starts. So I'm just going to read it through and then I'm going to talk about it. 
Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventures piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Now I'm going to sh um, show you what that means um, in our language very shortly, but I just wanted to say um, briefly, Shakespeare has written this as a poem. He's written it in iambic pentameters. I'll tell you what those are in a minute. Um, and that's the Greek influence. Okay. Now this poem has 14 lines and it has a rhyme scheme. So we've got dignity, mutiny, seen and clean, foes, overthrows, life, strife, love, remove, it's a little bit awkward, but that's okay. Um, rage, stage, attend, mend. So the pattern here, the rhyme pattern, and the number of lines, 14 lines, makes it a sonnet. And a sonnet, even though this is about death here and about fighting between two families, a sonnet is um, traditionally about love and devotion, um, religious devotion, about pursuing a love that you'll never really find. So um, it's it kind of gives away the plot here. It tells us Romeo and Juliet are going to die um, because their families can't agree with each other. And so he gives away the plot, but he's also telling us that it's going to be a play about love because he started it off with a sonnet and we associate sonnets with love. But because some of it's a little bit awkward, you know, love and remove are a little bit awkward. And because some of these lines don't seem to quite have 10 syllables in them. He's saying, actually, it is awkward, it is difficult, because this is a love that can't possibly um, be settled and comfortable because these families can't get along with each other. So Romeo and Juliet aren't destined to have a smooth ride through their relationship. It's all going to end up in tears. Um, I said I'd tell you what iambic pentameters are. So if you count the syllables in lines of poetry, then iambic pentameters will have 10 syllables. And the, the prefix pent in the word pentameter means five. So you've got 10 syllables divided by five. So they're in groups of two syllables which are called iams please don't worry if this is confusing i'm going to i'm going to show you what i mean in a minute um let's look at this line here a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life let me read that again so that you can hear that it's got 10 syllables a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so a pair if we take those two words together, okay, that's an I am because you're supposed to read it as an unstressed, stressed syllable. So unstressed means it's sort of quite flat and stressed means it's raised a bit. And then this would be in a group of two as well. So you would read of in a flat way and star has raised a bit. Let me let me show you, I'm going to exaggerate, let me show you what it sounds like. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Now nobody speaks like that or reads like that, but this is an idea that's come from those ancient Greek tests. So you can you can blame Cosimo de Medici if these are difficult. Um, but it does recognise that there are patterns in speech, that our speech rises and falls. And if you watch um, the film of Romeo and Juliet, they don't they don't talk in that very um, manufactured way that I just did it. But it does reflect the fact that language goes up and down, and actually it's a beautiful thing and makes us appreciate that uh, things like plays and poems are there to be heard rather than just to be um, read. But when you've got a line that is a bit awkward, 
and let's take this one and the continuance of their parents raised well that sounds like the wrong number of syllables unless you can squeeze two syllables in the word continuance into um, one and the continuance of their parents rage but again that's awkward just like the rhyme love and remove is awkward and as I said um, moments ago it's Shakespeare's way this is my interpretation it's Shakespeare's way of telling us that the path of Romeo and Juliet's love relationship just isn't going to be an easy one don't worry if you don't understand what iambic pentameters are from that explanation um, uh, hopefully it just helps you to understand that, that it's a bit awkward at the beginning so how can I summarise that play in our language? Well, this is what this prologue here means to me. Two families equal in status or importance, if you like, in Verona, where our play is set, start a new row in a long history of hatred. Out of these two families come Romeo and Juliet, who fall in love but who are destined to die because of this long history of hatred. It is only through their deaths that their families bury their hatred for one another. It took the deaths of their children to make them realise how stupid their hatred was. And this is what our play is about. So all of that language there that might look very confusing just means this. Shakespeare giving away the plot of the play. So I hope that's been at least a little bit helpful and even if some of the ideas have left you a bit confused, as I said at the beginning of this video, don't worry about that too much. It just might have given you a little bit of insight into the background of Romeo and Juliet and if nothing else you may have find, found some of the ideas interesting. So good luck with the, the work and I'll try and post more videos that are helpful to you. Um, we'll have a look next at the fight scene, the beginning scene in the play.